Welcome to the Booktopia podcast. I'm Sarah McDowling and I am very excited to be chatting today with the amazing Professor Tim Flannery about his brand new book, Explore Your World, Deep Dive into Deep Sea. Tim, thanks for coming on today. Oh, it's, it's a great pleasure, Sarah. It's really good. Uh, now, last time you were a guest on the podcast, we were talking about the sort of precursor to this book, Explore Your World, Weird, Wild, Amazing, which was one of our best-selling kids' books of last Christmas. Um, did you know at that time when we were talking that this book was in the works or sort of how long has this been in the making? Yeah, look, I had been, um, I guess, you know, I'd been planning with the publisher to do something if the, um, if the first book was successful. And, you know, one of my lifelong obsessions is the deep ocean. And so <laughs> that was what I really wanted to do. And Hardy Grant were, were kind enough to, to say, oh, that sounds okay. <laughs> <laughs> like when you learn about the deep ocean, it's not just this black nothing. It is one of the most fascinating habitats on earth. Uh, I haven't actually been lucky enough to see a finished copy of this book yet. Um, I'm really, I'm looking forward to holding it in my hands, but the blurb asks some very intriguing questions like, can you see ghosts in the deep sea? And what on earth is a headless chicken monster? And I just wondered, are you comfortable answering at least maybe one of those questions or would you rather sort of keep it a secret? Um, oh, look, I'll answer one and not okay. the other. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, the headless chicken monster is this crazy looking thing that floats around in you know, the deepest part of the ocean, really. And it's this, it's kind of the colour of an uncooked chicken, you know, it looks kind of orangey white, you know, and it's got these funny looking arms that look like little chicken arms and where the head would be on a chicken is just this sort of like neck chopped off a bit. It's kind of weird. <laughs> but, but what it actually is, is a swimming sea cucumber. I mean, it's unbelievable that such a thing should exist. Because um, when you look at sea cucumbers, they're just like, they look like just what they say. They look like cucumbers that lay on the bottom of the sea and they just take in food at one end and kind of excrete out the other. But this thing somehow has, decided it's going to kind of float about in the current. <laughs> and, and why it would develop this shape like a headless chicken monster, nobody knows. But it's certainly one of the most bizarre creatures on our entire planet. And that's its official name? It is. It's, it's <laughs> you said, it looks so much like a headless chicken monster. I mean, it, it just, there's nothing else it could be. It took me a while when I first saw the photos to think, is this really right? Is this actually a sea cucumber? Because I kind of seen sea cucumbers. But once you know it's a sea cucumber, you can work out, oh, yeah, that's right. That's the kind of uh, mouth there and so forth. But it takes a while. <laughs> I, um, I always learn the most amazing things from you. Um, I remember last time you told us the story of the immortal jellyfish or the AKA zombie jellyfish. And that has stuck with me. I can't tell you how many times over the past year I've just been going about my daily routine and suddenly the information will come back into my head there's an immortal jellyfish somewhere out there in the ocean yeah, um, it's been around since the age of the dinosaurs <laughs> possibly you know just being immortal <laughs> Who knows? um does considering this book is all about the sea does the immortal jellyfish make an appearance in this one uh, no look i tried not to duplicate double up yeah. Double, yeah, double up because i thought that wasn't really fair and besides you know when you start getting into the deep ocean the amount of or well, the volume number of strange creatures is just so high you've got endless choices you know and and the thing is people keep on discovering things in the deep ocean i mean even really big things that people didn't know about you know are turning up so yeah it was, i was spoiled for choice oh, what would have been one of the most recent discoveries of something really big in the ocean that we didn't know about well one of the biggest invertebrates ever discovered um was, was recently found um, in the deep ocean. And it's a long stringy thing. <laughs> it's the best way to describe it, kind of made of jelly. It's, uh, it's called a siphonophore, and it's made up of a whole lot of separate parts, each one of which is actually genetically an animal, but they're all joined up and they do special things. So one animal will feed, another one will protect the colony, another one will kind of give the direction to the, the colony. And it's like this long, like a train, if you can imagine a train with different carriages on it, that can like be, I think they can be like 30 metres long, these things, wow. floating around in the deep ocean. <laughs> I mean, really, that sort of stuff, I, I think, is it, it's not an animal, it's sort of a colony of animals, but each one of the animals does a special job, you know, just like in a factory. 
handful of people. Mm. And there it is in the perpetual dark, freezing waters of the deep ocean, you know, doing its thing. And, oh, wow, I just think that's amazing. <laughs> Uh, in the course of writing this book, because I, you know, considering um, how learned you are about all of this, I just imagine you sitting down and, and just writing all the information that's stored in your head. But I was wondering, do, did you, when, when you researched the book, like, did you learn about anything new during the course of researching for this? Or was it all kind of detailing things you're already aware of? No, I sure did learn some new things, I can tell you. <laughs> I just, well, you know, the thing is, I've been fascinated with the deep ocean ever since I was a kid. And I read an old Ge National Geographic magazine about a guy called William Beebe, who went down into the deep ocean, like in 1930, off this amazing place called New Nonsuch Island in the Bahamas. It's a great name in itself, you know, but he invented this sort of steel ball um, on a string with a telephone line on it. And, and he went, was sunk himself down into the ocean. And can you imagine having the guts to do that? You know, no, no. one down there. Like, and he could barely squeeze into this ball. He had, there was two people in it, right? And they were just stuck right inside this tiny little kind of steel ball with a window about like that big, not very big to look out. And he saw these ghostly shapes and things. And he's, he's got the telephone line up to the surface and he's saying, oh, you know, thousands and thousands of people have come past this point. He's down like about 100 metres, you know, in times past. Um, so I'm not the first, but I'm the first one ever to come back up, I hope. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Brown sailors falling down. Oh, it's, it's just such a great, <laughs> it's such a great account, you know. Oh, my gosh. And then the woman on the end of the tele telephone was one of his kind of assistants, but she was a really intelligent, super intelligent um, uh, marine biologist. And on her birthday, I think it was her 21st birthday, William Beebe said to her, why don't you go down in the bathyscape? And she went down so far, she said a record for women divers that wasn't beaten like for 60 years. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Fantastic. Yeah, it was an amazing story. I want a biopic about this. Yeah. Oh look, he was just, he was a totally crazy guy. I mean, you know, and he saw these, what he said were monsters in the deep ocean, but all he was seeing really was the, phosphorescence like the lights in the deep ocean as big things moved around so he couldn't really tell what they were but wow. he really fired people's imagination including mine about wanting to explore the deep sea do you think there are any you know big huge monsters out there that that we don't know about well let me tell you you know the <laughs> you know the giant squid yes right? it's been known for a long time right do you think it's the biggest squid in the world uh, I, I, I would have thought so, but now I'm questioning that. <laughs> yeah, you're quite right to question it because there's an even bigger squid discovered more recently called the colossal squid. Oh my God. And the colossal squid is far larger in terms of its mass than, than the giant squid. And it's only known like from two individuals. So, you know, maybe they're out there somewhere, there's a super colossal squid. We just don't know. I mean, people don't get down to the deep ocean very often. And, you know, Sarah, I mean, more people have been to the moon than have been down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, which is the deepest part of the ocean. It's That's just, wild. Yeah. It's like still the frontier, the, you know, the frontier. Of oh, America. my gosh. I, that is, I, that's, I think that's another fact that's going to stay with me. Oh, wow. Cool. Wow. Uh, so now um, can you tell us what it's like, you know, you've written so many books and writing for children as well as adults. What's the experience like for you as a writer, writing for kids versus writing for adults? And, you know, like, does one take longer or is one more fun or do you prefer one? Oh, look, I'm, I'm still, I think I'm still learning how to write for kids, Sarah. And I want, I want to bring that freshness and that wonder. And that does take a, a bit of effort, you know, or, or to put your mind in a certain place to do it, you know. So it's quite different from the stuff I do for adults, which are more fact-filled and, and so forth. Um, but you know, what I love for writing for kids is going to a, a bookshop and there'll be this little kid who is totally besotted with your book, you know, <laughs> I mean, in a very overt way, adults always hold back a bit, you know, and they're kind of like, you know, 
<laughs> they don't want to be such a kind of groupie, but the kids don't care. They just love it and they love all the information. And they say, look, I've read it seven times and all this sort of stuff. You know, wow. so it's fantastic. So, so I really love, I love writing for kids, um, but it is challenging. Um, and the illustrations in, in this book and the, and the previous one are by um, Sam Caldwell. Uh, what's, what's it like working with an illustrator? How collaborative is it or um, do you kind of work quite separately? Look, we work reasonably separately, but we do have these um, channels of feedback. So, you know, I produce the text and he then does illustrations from it. But um, then I have a look at some draft illustrations and I make some comments like there's sometimes there's things that could be done a little bit better or, you know, um, a bit more, well, I shouldn't say better, but I should say scientifically more accurate, maybe. Mm. Um, so, but, but Sam has got this genius of bringing sort of, um, what do I say, the, the character of the creature to life, if you know what I mean? Like yeah. he can make it, he can bring the essence of the thing to life in his drawings in a way that amazes kids and immediately keys in with the kids. They say, oh, that's what that's about, you know? <laughs> and even me sometimes, I, I look at it because all you've seen is a, a shriveled up old fish in a bottle in a museum, you know, or something. And he can sort of bring it to life. And it's great, you know, it's fantastic. Uh, it's very, very talented artist. They're really, they're really wonderful. Um, I found, um, as I said, I haven't seen the new book yet, but um, the first one was just, you could get lost in it. I think it was such a, I gave it to a lot of people for Christmas, a lot of kids. Wow. So I'm anticipating doing the same thing with this new one. Um, Tim, you have such an amazing career being a professor and a writer and a scientist and a paleontologist and an environmentalist and a conservationist and explorer. And I'm fairly sure I'm missing a few things there on that list. Um, but I wondered if you could go back in time and tell little young Tim Flannery, you know, that when you were the age of the kids that you're writing this book for, um, would he be surprised by all the things you've achieved by 2020? I think so. I, um, <laughs> I never thought I was going to live that long. I thought, you know, when I was kind of in my mid-teens, I thought being 40 was unbelievably ancient. <laughs> and here I find myself much older. Uh, 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 but I was a bit of a solitary kid, you know. I was a bit of a dreamer, wander around. My dad said, oh, you're always in your own world, you know, wandering around. It was sort of true. I was. Um, uh, and, you know, but I was always thinking about what things, what things might have been like here in the past, you know. I was always yeah. interested in fossils and, um, you know, I, I couldn't wander anywhere without thinking, oh, maybe dinosaurs walked here once or there was, you know, <laughs> the sea was here or something. That was just, a, that was my fascination. Um, and I always wonder when I'm lucky enough to speak to people such as yourself who are so accomplished, like what's, what is left on the bucket list? Like what, do you, do you, what are your um, things that you haven't ticked off your list yet? Oh, well, look, I've seen hardly anything of South America. I would love to see the forests of South America. I'd love to see West Africa. I haven't spent any time in West Africa. Um, what else would I like to do? I'd like to discover some more fossils, you know. I love to use the <laughs> fossils. So I'm a very eager volunteer on any fossil dig that comes along. Um, yeah, so I suppose, I, I don't know, there's lots of things that, that, that I feel like I want to do. Um, you may not be able to tell me the exact number offhandedly, but what is roughly the number of um, animals that you have discovered yourself? Uh, look, I've discovered and named about 30 species of modern mammals and maybe 60 species of extinct animals. Uh, do you have a favourite out of those? Oh, look, I really do, and it's a tree kangaroo called Dingiso, which is a big black and white tree kangaroo that's only found in West Papua. And it, um, it's, it's, uh, it looks like a panda, you know, the Chinese panda, the black and white yeah. panda? Yeah. So discovering that in 1995, I just thought, wow, no one knows about this animal. You know, no one outside the area where it lives, except me, uh, just for a few days anyway. And that was amazing. Oh, um, so we're kind of running close to our time limit, but um, before we end the conversation, I just want to know what's up next? Are you working on another book at the moment? Well, yes, it so happens I am. <laughs> Anticipating that people will like a deep dive into the deep ocean. I'm working with my daughter, actually, Emma, who is, um, she's a proper trained scientist, you know, she's, she's very, very good. 
on a sort of a weird, wild, amazing for the past, because oh, I love wow. fossils and stuff, you know, so much. I want to take that concept and go back to the very beginning of life and say, what are the weirdest, wildest, most amazing things that have ever lived on our planet? Not just to live there today, but like ever. That so is such a cool idea. Yeah, it's going to be good fun. What's it like working with your daughter? Oh, it's, it's a pure pleasure. Because I've, you know, I'm fairly busy. So just getting some time with her is wonderful. And having a joint project together is just fantastic. So we, you know, share things around. And she says, wow, that's amazing. And I say, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> Where did you find that out from? It's great. So we just kind of riff off each other. It's good fun. Oh, and that... she's, she's spent her life coming out on fossil digs with me too. So she's got the fossil fever as well. So That is so cool. I am really looking forward to that. When roughly can we expect to see that book out in the world? Oh, look, I think it, it's next year planning. I don't know exactly. I'd have to uh, talk to the publisher. And I suppose it still depends upon us delivering the manuscript, which is <laughs> that we haven't done yet. So, yeah, so take a bit of time. Oh, um, well, Tim, thank you so much for coming and being a guest on our podcast and talking to me today. It has been an absolute pleasure. Great. Thank you and, so much, Sarah. It's been wonderful <laughs> being with you. And um, podcast listeners, you can get your copy of Explore Your World, Deep Dive into Deep Sea, as well as all of Tim Flannery's amazing backlist at your local bookshop or online at Bookopia. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces and more. Or, if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia. Australia's local bookstore at booktopia.com.au